Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Susan O'Keefe, and I will be chairing this session. And I'm delighted and looking forward very much to the input from both the panelists and, of course, from yourselves. Um, I've had the pleasure of being involved with the Heritage Council for sessions like this before, and I know how enthusiastic and well-connected and interested you are. So I see already people uh, logging in from Kildare, from Bear Island, from Green Ore, uh, from Mitchellstown, the home of good cheese, as we know, uh, Cork Traveller Women, the RCSI, and many, many more. And you are all very welcome, particularly uh, at this lunchtime, to give up your time uh, to be more prepared, I guess, for one of the best events of the year, uh, undoubtedly, which is Heritage Week. So, without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Pierce O'Queeve, and Pierce is the media uh, uh, head of, sorry, head of communications uh, uh, at the Heritage Council. Uh, Pierce. Diva Cardia at Tosulam Gulshavilug Gama on Pranona. Marador Susan Dierkanchin is Bishop Pierce O'Queeve, Bonish Dor Commerside, the Lashagoria Rachta. Kurum Fodu Wuru Vilog, er son of Hoyle Arctinov, Tikim Gulshav, Fad, Gnohoch, August Gutogan Chapisa. Iorachta agus pisa fuinne frastar hemanar grace on den torcha so um, tamed buichti vanchaniov. Um, so I'm Pierce O'Queeve, head of communications and public affairs with the Heritage Council. Um, at first, I'd just like to welcome you all to today's webinar for Heritage Week event and project organisers, the first of two. Um, I know you're all very busy people, uh, and that it can sometimes take a bit of energy and effort to tear yourselves away from day-to-day -day work um, to attend a webinar like this. So we do appreciate you taking the time. Um, I really hope you find today's webinar interesting and useful. Uh, I'm sure you will. Um, there's some really good speakers lined up to talk to you, which you'll find out more about once I exit stage left here, which you'll be glad to hear will be very shortly. Um, I am biased, of course, because I do work for the Heritage Council, but I'm really excited um, about National Heritage Week this year. Um, I only joined the Heritage Council in April, so I'm probably irritatingly enthusiastic <laughs> about everything. Um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing your events, uh, be they in person, uh, or online, um, and I've heard nothing but wonderful things about the heritage volunteers, professionals, experts, um, who go through incredible effort every year to put on brilliant events. Um, and I was just having a look at our photo archives the other day from Heritage Weeks gone by, um, and was just met by all these smiling children's faces um, staring back at me as they learned a new skill or, or admired uh, an unusual plant uh, or listened to a speaker. Um, so it's really great to be back in full flight again. Um, this year, and we officially opened National Heritage Week um, at Nanonega Place in Cork on Monday under a baking sun, uh, which would have been lovely were it not for having to wear a heavy suit and shirt. Uh, so not long to go now. Um, and with that, I'll hand you over to Lila. Um, I'd just like to thank you again for your time and hope you enjoy the rest of the webinar. Mila Great. Uh, thank you, Piers. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Lila, and I work with DHR Communications, and we are working with the Heritage Council to deliver National Heritage Week 2022. <clears throat> this afternoon, I just wanted to give a short introduction to Heritage Week, especially for any newcomers this year, and highlight a few important themes and key dates for you. So you've probably heard by now that this year's focus is on sustainability and the creation of a more resilient world. So we have two recommended themes for this. Firstly, sustainable heritage, which is an, in an invitation to organizers to consider how we can conserve our rich, built, cultural, and natural heritage to help build a more sustainable future. This theme focuses on connecting with, preserving, and adapting skills and traditions of the past and passing them on to the next generation. So for example, this might involve researching a part of Irish history to shed light on Irish society today, or it might focus on something like passing on knowledge to children in your community or to just new members of your community. Our other theme for this year is biodiversity, which is an invitation to organizers to encourage greater appreciation of the natural world, looking at local plant and animal life and contributing to the conservation of native species and natural landscapes. You might ask yourself how you can preserve habitats or look into sustainable farming practices or urban greening. You might also research an element of Irish landscape to increase local and natural appreciation for preservation. Now, you don't have to stick to these themes, but they are recommended for this year. 
but all heritage events and projects are welcome, of course. So just as in previous years, we're also um, promoting Water Heritage Day and Wild Child Day. So Wild Child Day is gonna be a little bit different this year, just in the date. So we are moving it to the final weekend of Heritage Week. Last year, it was on a Wednesday. This year, it's going to be on Saturday, August 20th. And this is a day where we encourage kids and families to get outdoors, to enjoy and explore heritage and biodiversity in their locality, which might involve visiting somewhere you haven't been before or going somewhere that you know well and looking at it differently. We are also encouraging you to reach out to families who might be on holiday in your locality. So whether that's Irish families or international visitors who might just happen to be around during Heritage Week, and they are definitely a potential audience for you as well. Water Heritage Day will be the following day on Sunday, August 21st. And it is a collaboration between the Heritage Council and the Local, Authorities Water, Local Authority Waters Program to celebrate water in all of its forms and our connections with it. So if you have events or projects that are on either uh, water heritage or connect with children, you can be sure to tick that box when you're filling out your event and project forms, which I'll get to in a moment, so that people can find it more easily on the website. So on that, um, as Pierce mentioned, we're very happy to open Heritage Week on Monday with our launch at Nanonagel Place, but the organizers portal has been open for a few days previous. So it is open now, and when you log in, you'll create an account. Um, if you have an account from last year, your login details will still apply. And then you'll be prompted to fill out either an event or a digital project form. Um, so you'll just choose whichever you like. You can fill out multiple event forms, multiple project forms. You can fill out one of each. They can be related or not. Just know that they should be separated. Um, so if you're having an event, but you're also creating a video on your topic, that would be a separate project and event form. Um, the deadline for posting your events to heritageweek.ie is August 23rd. Um, and all this information is available on the website as well. Once you upload your project or event form, uh, one of the Heritage Week team members, myself or any of my colleagues will take a look, double check everything, all of your information is present um, and then get it posted as soon as possible within two to three days. Um, and we already have several projects live on the website right now, which is really exciting. Um, just as a reminder to double check everything when you are filling out your forms, spelling, grammar, if you'd like to upload an image, that would be fantastic. Um, all of that, all that kind of technical stuff. Um, as you are going through this, you can feel free to reach out with questions to uh, our email, heritageweek at heritagecouncil.ie or by phone, and we'll hopefully get you sorted there. But as well, be sure to check out our resources on the website, which include um, uh, developing your project page, which would be research ideas, different uh, heritage resources uh, throughout the country, which might be useful to you. A technical resources page, so if you would like to create a video or a PowerPoint or a podcast but aren't sure where to get started, we have some advice on there, as well as some advice on how to upload your uh, links and embed links and other items to the project form correctly. Um, and the final resource that we have is all of our logos and branded resources. Um, things like social media banners, our general logo, PowerPoint templates, press release templates, things like that. And it's all available both in English and in Irish. So as I mentioned, Heritage Week uh, opened on Monday. Um, just a couple other key dates to highlight. So of course, it runs from the 13th to, to the 21st of August. The final deadline for uploading your information is August 23rd which I know is after Heritage Week. It just gives you a couple more days to get your information up there. Um, so don't be alarmed by those dates. So Heritage Week ends on the 21st, but you have until the 23rd to upload your information. The final point that I will mention there is the awards. Um, so we're doing awards a little bit differently this year. Um, last year, you would have been automatically qualified once you uploaded your project or event to the website. This year, you'll be filling out a separate application. So if you don't feel like going for an award, you don't have to. Um, so we'll be releasing information about that shortly, but the awards will be open for submissions from mid-August. And so I think that about does it for me, Susan. Um, I know that was a lot of information in there. Feel free to get in touch with us or explore our website, and I'll be putting a few emails and 
phone numbers into the chat box, et cetera. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, Lila, for, for all that really relevant information. Remembering again that the actual week is the 13th to the 21st of August. So we're delighted also to have Michael with us, who's signing uh, for people who, who, who need signing. And it's a great thing to have so that we are, you know, being inclusive as we can be. So just to say, Heritage Week is a huge enterprise. You know, when you think about all the organizations, some of you here have been doing Heritage Week for quite a number of years. Others I see in the chat uh, are new. And that's great that people are joining and, uh, and, and taking part uh, for the first time and people who have great experience. And it's a great week because it deserves to be a great week, protecting our heritage uh, in any way that we can, understanding it, sharing it with our families, uh, with our neighbours, with our children. Always a lovely thing to do. And we know that from the humble seed to the great cathedral, everything in between is part of our heritage. And to bear that in mind when, when you might be casting around for an idea that you think uh, might suit this great week. That brings, I think, a lot of pleasure to people as well as information and learning and brings pleasure to the volunteers, particularly who take part, uh, as well as the academics and researchers and professionals for whom this is part of your life. So without further ado, remember that we have the chat box there if you have a question and we will keep an eye on the questions. And to say that if you are going to be registering your event with National Heritage Week uh, uh, via the, the website, please do so as early as you can, because of course then you have more publicity uh, for your event if you can be early. I know it's not for everybody, but you can be bear that in mind. Uh, so I'm going to hand over in the first instance to uh, Sarah Malone. And Sarah is uh, um, the uh, Heritage Officer at Leitrim County Council. And of course, there are Heritage Officers across all the, the local authorities in Ireland, and they form a great network of people of passion, of interest, and who work on behalf of Heritage at the local level where you live, and therefore are there to assist you, but also to do the important work about helping to protect our, our built and nat natural heritage. Sarah uh, is going to talk a little bit about a project they, they have already started last year, but are continuing this year, and it relates to the Leitrim Chair. So Sarah, I'm delighted to make you welcome. Thank you, Susan. Um, and like Susan said, um, the Heritage Officers are in every local authority and we're always delighted to hear from uh, people about projects uh, for Heritage Week or throughout the year. So um, our, our details are on the Heritage Council website or on the local authority website. So um, get, definitely get in touch with your local, um, local authority heritage officer. Um, but yeah, I'm here to talk today about the Leitrim Chair Project. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen here. I've got a slide just to illustrate um, what the Leitrim Chair looks like. Um, so. No, so that's that's the the Leitrim chair there with some with some clips from the project. So the project um, started last year and then it's kind of evolved and and we're continuing it this year. Last year it was just purely a video that we did. And um, so the Leitrim chair, it's um, a very common everyday object that would have been very common across the northwest of the country. It's a, a very simple chair and and it would have been. It would have been used um, and, and made locally and sold locally for, for not that much money. Um, but now it's kind of gone out of use. And I think if you ask most people in Leitrim around um, this part of the country, they would probably have never heard of the Leitrim chair. And um, so one of the aims of the project was to um, kind of celebrate this lovely, simple, beautiful piece of furniture, but also to get people making it again and to get it back into people's homes. So the concept was to produce a video and it was inspired by um, Jack Surlis and a hands video that was done in maybe the, the 70s, I think it was. And so the RTE hand series, um, they visited Jack Surlis, who was, um, his family are originally from Leitrim and he'd moved over just across the border into Sligo and the family, there were a family of coopers and um, carpenters. And the Leitrim chair really kind of kept, became synonymous with Jack Surlis. And there's a lovely um, hands video, you can, you can look at it on YouTube, 
And um, so he makes showing him how he show how he made showing how he made the leitrim chair, and he used um, the real traditional techniques like using the axe to, to cut the wood, and he used the, the horse to kind of to shape it and um, techniques that probably go back a millennium. Um, but we wanted to update um, those techniques to modern kind of carpentry um, techniques um, that, that people would be able to, um, to use, like your bench saw, and, and um, they'd be able to replicate the, replicate the chair. Um, so we kind of, so for the video, um, I initially approached a, um, a really talented woodworker. You can see Charles there in the, in the photograph. So Charles um, agreed to um, be part of the project, um, and then I engaged with a videographer who um, who videoed Charles and the various steps of making making the making the chair. And we also approached the National Museum um, in Turlock House in Castle Bar, um, and they were really keen to be involved. And um, so we had Rosa Meehan, who's a real expert in probably loads of different areas, but she knows an awful lot about traditional Irish chairs and they have a beautiful collection um, in Turlock House in Castle Bar. So we, as part of the video, um, we, myself and Charles and the videographer visited at, um, Rose at the National Museum. We took some clips of the different types of chairs that you get and Rosa spoke to the camera and kind of introduced the kind of historical context for the chair and she spoke a bit about Jack Serlis. And you can actually see Jack Serlis, this is a little clip from the hands video. This is him here in the middle with his two sons um, and he's making the chair um, as, part of, as part of that. Um, and then and the other images are just of the, from, from the video um, that we produced at the end of it. Um, so that was it. So it was kind of a, the, the, the video that we produced, it was kind of a combination of, of the kind of historical expert, the, the clips um, from showing the, the old techniques of making it and then um, kind of a, a good bit, of probably 50% of the videos, kind of Charles kind of showing how to make it. Um, and then we also on the website, one that we, la we launched the video as part of Heritage Week um, last year. And we also had um, Charles kind of draw a diagram of the chair and had all uh, like a measured drawing. So you can just go on the website and download that measured drawing if it, and you, you can make the chair yourself. Um, so I suppose it's, it's really it, like it's sustainable heritage. We're kind of, we're, we're, we were inspired by the video and we're um, continuing this this tradition, but we're also documenting documenting it for, for future generations as well. And um, so I suppose there's, there's two aspects of sustainability there, um, but it's a framework that can be used across um, across loads of different kind of heritage traditions. Um, and it, just, it doesn't have to be ju just kind of a craft. Um, but, but this year we're continuing the, the Leitrim Chair project um, and we're um, running three workshops. Um, the first one is with a men's shed group and then the other two are, will be open to the public. So our ambition is to kind of get, um, get people back making, making the Leitrim Chair and maybe selling the Leitrim Chair, maybe setting up a little business or, or just kind of, or just maybe passing on, passing on the knowledge that they learn in the workshops um, and just getting people back and um, using the, um, those, those techniques. Um, so yeah, it was it was quite a simple project. Um, the budget wasn't um, it was it was a small budget. It was all in all, including the the videographer and the carpenter, it came to about two and a half thousand euro last year for the video, and then this year for the workshops, they're 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 kind of they're a separate budget. Um, but um, you wouldn't you don't you, you could actually do it if if like a, a heritage group if they had if they had like a local. Um, a local craftsperson who had the knowledge and the skills who they might need to be paid and if you had somebody who was kind of handy with handy with a camera um, and good at editing you could actually do you wouldn't you don't actually need a budget to do to do a project like this and I found in the past with videos they're a, a brilliant way of kind of starting off projects if there's some something that you have in your local community or some heritage aspect of heritage that people are interested in um, uh, uh, producing a video is a really good way of kind of um, getting the story out there and um, kind of gauging people's interests. And there's several uh, projects that I that I ran that have started off as videos, and then the, like this has, this this project is developing into workshops, and have other other projects and different heritage teams that have developed um, in kind of organically into di different types of projects as well. So I think videos are are a really nice way to kind of initiate a heritage project.
Um, but I think that's I think that's kind of the, the the main points. Great, thank you so much, Sarah. And you're you're absolutely right. Video uh, is a very practical way now. It didn't used to be, but it is now for you to start off and for people to see that might never have been able to get to a workshop or don't quite understand sometimes how easy things can be or how interesting they can be. And when they see the video, they go, oh, oh, that's really great. And then they want to take part too. So it's a great way of advertising the effort that you've put in. And I love the idea of having uh, lots of Leitrim chairs. Um, you're quite right, actually. I was recently in the um, the exhibition in Castle Bar and they have a beautiful, they had at the time, a few months ago, a beautiful exhibition of the, all the various chairs from different parts of Ireland. And they are a lovely part of our heritage that, as you say, have been completely kind of forgotten. Although I promise not to take any kind of um, axe or anything to any object because that might end um, in tears. Um, but certainly you're right to, to say that people can try even to make a small video uh, even on their phones. Some people are very nifty and you can use your phone to edit if you're if you're handy with that. And even a, th even a minute of a video of somebody making something or showing how to make something can inspire others. Um, so thank you for that, Sarah. And we wish you well for, for this year's uh, expansion of the Leitrim Chair. And we look forward to you when you take over um, and surpass IKEA's efforts. We'll all be, we'll all be very pleased indeed. Um, so next, I would like to come to um, Annette Corkery, and Annette is one of the, the key people involved in, in Schelte Bio, uh, which has been involved with uh, Heritage Week now for 12 years. Uh, and of course, Annette and her colleagues also work very, um, very often in schools, they're, and they're an approved uh, Heritage in Schools organisation. And... Um, She's going to tell us some unusual stories about um, about protecting and keeping kale going, uh, and also uh, willows. So very much in the di biodiversity uh, side of this uh, sort of broader piece that that's of interest in Heritage Week. Um, so Annette, I, I'm, I'm I'm dying to hear about the kale. Hi, yeah. Um, well, just. To start, we, we opened uh, Arda Heritage and Creativity Centre in 2011, especially for Heritage Week. So we've been involved in various ways over the years, and it's always one of our favourite weeks of the year. So um, when we got to 2020, we had to come up with new ways of engaging with it. So um, that year we did a project where we um, invited people to explore their own townland and we put up videos showing them different ways they could do it through art and storytelling and uh, writing. So last year then we were looking for other ideas. Um, we videoed everything on a phone with no budget, just to say it can be done. But, um, I learned video editing skills as the week went along and um, we got, um, I think, 10 or 11 videos up in the end. But um, what we were trying to do, everything we do, we kind of connect back to our local legend of Mither and Athane. And Mither was in charge of restoring the balance. So we connected the restoring the balance story with um, the restoring the balance in nature and biodiversity. And so we asked then for locals if they had any living stories to share. Because um, over the years, we developed the, the scale to be all uh, part of the business as well, which was to bring the stories, the living stories to people rather than just everyone coming to us in Creative Arda. So we've been telling legends um, over the years to different audiences around the, the country. And um, last year we decided, well, living stories is also our biodiversity. So um, Brendan Farrell, who's our local gardener, uh, shared several stories with us, but the one that we picked for the video series was on his grandfather's golden osiers. So his grandfather used to grow these um, trees, the willow trees, in a certain way. And Brendan took us through his garden to show us how he has taken slips from those original trees and has them growing in his garden. And his brother actually is a basket weaver, so he takes... The willow then and creates baskets and things with it and plant stands in this. So we're trying to share those local living stories and 
um, bring it then to future generations. And Pat Kelleher had had this kale grown in his garden for generations. So he had actually just given us a few plants the year before. Um, he was just sharing the plants, but we thought that was a great story to, to add to this project as well. So we contacted Pat, said, would he mind if we saved seeds from his plants? And um, we got a short video from his garden and we researched the kale a bit and then researched how to save the seeds. So we have a video of me saving the seeds from his kale and then we have taken those seeds um, and shared them around the country as well. So um, we finished the week with the first in-person event we'd had in a couple of years and had a plant and um, seed swap. So everyone that came got a little pack of Pat Keller's seeds and we're getting video clips back from people going, look, here we've got your kale in Wicklow. And um, most recently I sowed them in with Nina Mora in Gaelsco Longford. And that was like special for Pat because he was one of the people who started Gaelsco Longford. So it's um, been there 25 years or so now. And it was nice for him to connect back with them and the kale has grown away. I was checking it yesterday. So <laughs> it's. Um, Are people surprised, Annette, at how easy that is as a project? That idea of suddenly thinking, well, there's this kale that's been growing in this place and, and we can share that. Were pe people, was that what drew them in, do you think, to taking the, the seeds? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And um, yeah, I suppose we, we don't think of kale, you kind of hear more of cabbage and that. But yeah, kale has been grown for generations. And it's so easy to use, you know, take a few leaves and it'll last the whole year. Um, so, yeah, but it, it was that connection with the local story that we kind of wanted to share as Heritage Week as well. And yeah, it's great to see people excited about the kale, actually. You know, every mm. seed is so special and yeah. popping up um, excites people. So Yeah, and it's so, lovely yeah. to be reaching out to people that live in your own community, as you say, the scale to the other keeping those stories alive and sharing them yeah. with a new generation. Yeah. Um, and people are fascinated, I think, when they get someone who really knows, don't they? Really understands something, um, a, a, like Pat does about the kale, has just been yeah. doing it for a long time. People yeah. love to touch or feel that experience, yeah. don't they? And it was great to do it in video form because those videos now are on our YouTube channel with a playlist for 2020 and playlist for um, last year. And yeah, everybody can connect in. So I'm going as a Heritage in Schools um, specialist then into schools and sh showing these clips. And yeah, I was able to you know, take the, sh let the children see where the seeds have come from before they put them in the ground. And right. um, we also have ones on um, our weeds and how important it is to, to leave some places wild and, um, yeah, the benefits for pollinators and that we have one on pond life and how easy just by putting in like even a tiny pond you bring all the this biodiversity in so easily so i've done that with a school this year as well we created their pond and they were delighted to see my pond in the video and now their pond had two frogs in it yesterday so <laughs> yeah so really the message is, is it's something very simple like kale seeds or a willow tree yeah. can be a whole genesis of, a, of ideas That's and encouraging people to talk about other things and it's something that can be done it doesn't cost a lot of money yeah. uh, but if you've got some expertise there as well that you can share and protect yeah and, add. and soon we'll have litrum chairs and kale so we're, we're doing very well um thank you so much annette and both, both of the the relevant videos, both from <clears throat> from Sarah and from Annette, are both uh, the links are, are there in the chat. Uh, if you would like to, to look at them yourselves after the event is over, uh, so th that's fantastic. And finally, uh, Lorcan Scott, uh, who has the the great job as the wildlife officer uh, for the actual Heritage Council, um, uh, and I know Lorcan has lots of experience before he came to the Heritage Council and is a hugely passionate uh, person about, about heritage and specifically about wildlife. So you're very welcome, uh, Lorcan. Thank you, Susan. Yes, uh, I started with the Heritage Council back in 2018 and uh, 
after a short introduction hit into COVID. So uh, I still feel a bit green around the gills in my work with the Heritage Council, but uh, it, it's very varied and very interesting. And um, it, it crosses all sorts of streams and that. Just to give you a little background, uh, my work is dictated through the current Heritage at the Heart um, Heritage Council strategy. So uh, I do work in relation to the national and local biodiversity action plans. Um, I, I would also reference things like uh, Heritage Ireland 2030. And um, we also look at a range of policy advice in relation to planning applications, policy submissions. Uh, there's recent ones on marine protected areas, things like that. Then, uh, you know, there's, there's wider international uh, policy in relation to the EU Biodiversity Strategy 2030, and we're just coming out now with the next uh, National Biodiversity Action Plan. Um, and then again, my, my work with Bi National Biodiversity Week and this National Heritage Week. So they're the sort of areas I'm working in, but we also work closely then with local community groups, uh, biodiversity action groups, people like Community Wetlands Forum, organizations like that, the NGOs in, in particular. So um, in terms of today and uh, the National Heritage Week 2022, um, I have that uh, interesting day of Wild Child Day, which is now on the Saturday, which is great to see. And I think that that will really help in, in gathering some children who are uh, just back from holidays and that. So that, that should work well. Um, what do you hope to see them doing, Lorcan? What, what yeah, do you hope well, to see the wild children doing? We're, we're hoping to get them outside and um, hopefully Irish weather will, will behave itself. Um, but children are very forgiving in this country. I mean, we all have to learn very quickly to uh, get busy doing or, or, or get busy not doing. So hopefully getting out and about is, is, is what it's all about. And that, that would be the, the main um, message I'm bringing. You know, kids want to get out of the house. They, they love their PlayStations and all the other technology. But a break from that, if, if you can get an activity where they are included, where it's focused on them, you know, you, you'll get it back in spades. So above all, you know, whatever the weather, if you can get them outside, put on a raincoat, a poncho, whatever you want, Wellingtons, get out and get dirty is, is the main message if you can. Um, you know, occasionally we get some very unusual weather where that just isn't an option. If you have a fallback in a community hall or something like that, that too can, you know, be a, a, an asset if needs be. But we're going on the basis that we'll get fair weather at least. Um, the other thing, because it's biodiversity and it's seasonal, some sort of working knowledge of the location that you're taking people to is a, a big asset. So uh, if you're talking about... Um, Swifts and that, August is very late in the season. They're going to be thin on the ground. Uh, orchids and that are also getting a bit thin. Uh, they're early flowering. You know, a bluebell walk isn't going to help you very much. Um, so, uh, sorry, you know, I was to share some screens, which I'll do here now, to get you all more visual. Uh, that's gone in the way, do that I can. And remember why Lorcan is doing that, that if you have questions or thoughts, please share them uh, in the chat and we will do our best to answer any thoughts or queries or suggestions that you have. Yeah. Just put them in this the chat. The chat has been recorded too, so I'll, I'll catch up on this after the yes. talk for sure. Yeah. So um, that's the person who's on. Sorry, catching up again. Okay. So yeah, having a, a good working knowledge of where you're going to bring them, what's, you know, try and get out there before you're, you're bringing people obviously making sure health and safety is there, that you're not taking them to any area that's dangerous. And that, that can sound uh, very simple, but it can be tricky too. Uh, if, if you're taking children, obviously, by the sea, you need to know your tide times well in advance if you're advertising uh, a, a coastal walk. And uh, some of the tides, some of the rip tides and that you can get where tides can come in behind you is, is also something to, to really bear in mind. Uh, in terms of groups and numbers, you know, if, if you're bringing a large group of 30 people, there would be some very sensitive habitats that that's just not clever. You know, if it's a 
an orchid meadow you don't want 30 people trampling across somewhere that doesn't have a path to, to safely get them through you don't want to be bringing dogs in in August during the bird nesting season which would run to the end of that month so uh, you know they, they would at least have to be on a lead and uh, under control uh, things that would be good to think about are dragonflies are very busy right up to the end of the summer there are some late butterflies which which you'll also pick up on and um, I know too now from previous work with the National Parks and Wildlife Service that's guiding a walk that uh, smaller children are all looking for you know they're, they're going to be looking for foxes badgers uh, apex predators and you know uh, any group of people is are you know going to be very lucky to meet anything like that so letting them know in advance of their expectations of the general things you'll say is worth doing uh, so that the complaints don't come in at the end from the children wondering where they all are. Um, and, you know, to bear in mind too that uh, biodiversity is all around us. So it includes our urban biodiversity, our rural biodiversity. There are lots of canal walks, uh, parks and that, that will have excellent biodiversity to, to pick on um, to pick up on in towns and cities as well as the open countryside. Um, so, Great. Uh, yeah. some, uh, not to forget your sunblock, I think, as well. We, we're hopeful, Lorcan, that we'll need sunblock. <laughs> and I guess sensible shoes would be another thing, particularly sometimes small children have just sandals or something, and then you, you get a bit adventurous and go up a hill and suddenly they're slipping and sliding. So to just be thinking ahead, I guess, for those things. That won't hurt in any way, you know, a small first aid kit in, in a rucksack, uh, just yeah. in case there's a, a cut or graze or anything like that can save the day. Yeah. So again, from uh, so, some of what I talked about and just experience that I've had over the years, you know, um, what's really stimulating for kids is if they can get involved. So it's hands on. and If you can get your hands on some hand lens or magnifying glasses, you know, showing them the, the micro uh, details that wildlife can offer, even things like you know explaining how horse chestnut trees get their name and showing them the little horseshoe, um, really simple practical things, making daisy chains. It, it's something that they can do that they're involved in. You're not talking over them. They're involved and uh, they they really um, prosper on, on on that. If, if you're not talking down to them. But including that, that that will work best. Um, I'm sorry, you, um, your slides are a bit stuck there. Would you mind? You, can you just stop sharing and maybe share again? Just your yeah. slides. Yeah. No problem. Uh, nearly there anyway. Does that work? Yeah. Oh, yes, that's better. Thanks for working. Okay. Um, if, if you can touch base with a, a local champion who knows their biodiversity, if you don't have that knowledge, that's a great thing. There may be a bird watch group in your area. There might be a bat conservation group. Um, certainly kids really enjoy getting out in the evenings. Um, and Bat Conservation Ireland have some people who, who might be available, but it's a busy time for them, so I wouldn't be depending on them. But uh, local heritage officers sometimes have Bat detectors available to local community groups for such events, and that's worth checking out. Um, but you know, again, as local as you can, because they will know. Nobody knows the area better than people who are walking, living in that area, and they'll know the nuances of what you you might see uh, and what you should see. So, an expert can add to that and might show you something that you're passing all the time and weren't aware of. Uh, maybe signs of otters, things of like that. That's, you know, are very hard to spot in, in reality, but uh, with, with a bit of specialization, you can see some of the clues and the, the signs and tracks and signs that, that they leave behind. Um, Lorcan, what's the best way, particularly with younger children, but indeed with all of us, I guess, to, to try to um, persuade or encourage people to treat the environment, you know, well, not to drop their plastic bottles, uh, you know, not to have their picnic and, and leave the scraps or the, the bits. Like, I know we can keep saying those things, but is there, a, is there a clever kind of way of linking it very directly, particularly so that younger people get that message from the start and keep it with them as they go along themselves? Yeah, I, certainly from experience, you know, children are, are 
directly connected with nature and, and they appreciate it as a, as a given. You know, you don't have to tell them to love wildlife and animals and birds and even, you know, plants and that. So uh, what I often would do, again, using props, uh, would bring along the plastic uh, connectors for beer cans and explain to them that these are things that get caught up in wildlife and that a duck trying to feed at the bottom of a lake getting one of these around his neck can be its demise and they're horrified by such things and they're immediately invested. So uh, there are ways, you know, just to finding maybe an orchid or some very dramatic plant and explain to them that, you know, if we walk by here, that's fine. But if 30 people are doing it, you know, these plants find it very hard then to, to have a habitat that they can survive in. And they can they can get that, um, showing them you know some of the damage, some of the pollution that's in the, your river. Maybe you know showing them that the froth in the river, the algae growth would be a very good one. You could pick up a stone from the river if you have Wellingtons. Show them the algae growth on top that's stopping living animals. Turn it over where it's clean, and you should get caddis fly and and some um, shrimp and that hanging onto the rock underneath, and you can show them clean stone and algae growth and visually they'll get that very quickly great that, that might be a help lovely and i see that the um the headford and district association in county galway are developing a walk that they are planning to cover a distance of two and a half kilometers incorporating a wide meadow and hedgerows and bogland uh, so oh. that's um that sounds like a lovely a real life thing where they then share you share the environment by making by creating a walk uh, in that space. So that, that's a very, again, a very straightforward thing, although be it that it takes a lot of work, but it's a straightforward idea that you create a walk that you can then uh, share. The, uh, there are so many stories with our boglands now. A lot of these boglands, you know, because of climate change and sustainability, we're looking to cease production of, of commercial turf cutting in these places. But there are still brilliant stories of people who had many fine days cutting turf, you know, uh, non-commercially and uh, trying to get that message across that, look, we're in trouble, there's climate crisis, One of this carbon that's in the ground is so important. Uh, we're not asking everyone to stop. The people who heat their home and, and cook with it, you know, have a right there and we're, we're not stopping them. But large industry is just too fast, too big. And uh, trying to get that message across, there's lots of plants and animals associated with these boglands that are changing. Uh, curlew and that that people grew up with are getting harder to find even cuckoo now are, are almost west of the Shannon so they're they're sort of key species that uh, you you can use to get stories across about our ch changing world there's a lot of children with climate anxiety and uh, with stories and guidance you can certainly allay a lot of those fears that you know uh, we will get out of this uh, with work and if we all work together there are good times ahead. Absolutely. Um, just if I could ask um, Annette uh, again, Annette, you, you were saying uh, earlier that you had been involved with um, Heritage Week for uh, 12 years, which is a considerable length of experience and knowledge. Do you see any way in which people engage differently now or have more expectation or are they just simply always interested because people love to be outdoors and the wild child in all of us wants to get mucky and and touch things? Uh, I'd say there's a lot more happening with people trying to grow wildflowers at home, wildflowers and uh, leaving grass long and there seems to be a lot more people interested in what they can do and we always try to focus on the positive little things you can do like just leaving a strip uncut bring so much biodiversity and um yeah rather than focusing on the the doom and gloom we try and focus on the positive but yeah i definitely think people are more aware of trying to to add biodiversity and um yeah we had great reaction to last year's um videos and that but it, yeah. it's so different to the events before where people would come along next but um, so there's more engagement. People want more engagement, to be doing yeah. things themselves, yeah. which is yeah. great. Actually, yeah. that's really encouraging, isn't it? Because yeah. 
not only have we talked about, you write about the doom and gloom, but when you feel you're doing something to mitigate against that, then you feel like you're contributing to making things better. And that brings a well-being sense. So again, going back to the idea that that all of the things that, that you guys have been doing and continue to do uh, through telling stories, through uh, creating videos, through finding um, traditional stories, traditional methods of doing things, and taking them and sharing them with a wider community and, and encouraging them, like that lovely shot of the the two young boys in making to helping to make the Leitrim chair, mm. you know, and they look at home in the room. They completely are happy uh, trying to be trying to get involved with making the chair. So, so we're seeing more doing, which is great, and therefore that's something for the participants here today to be encouraged by. That each and every one of you that may go and 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 have a project or take part in a project or support others to do so, that there's a willing audience out there. And that you've seen that change over that 12 years, um, Annette, and that's that's really good to hear. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so does anybody have any particular uh, uh, questions or any, um, you know, things they want to know about that we haven't covered? Uh, somebody wants to know if the chat is being recorded, will it be available to people afterwards? Uh, perhaps one of the, um, perhaps, um, uh, somebody might be able to, Lila, or someone might be able to respond to that as to whether the chat, the content of the chat will be available. Yeah, to... we'll do our best. To there we go. Yeah. And, 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 and they will do their best uh, by, by email, particularly remembering this again, the size of the event, but also not to be afraid to try something that I think is the key message. It doesn't necessarily have to be finished this year. It doesn't even have to work fully this year, but having a go and taking part and encouraging others uh, to do so uh, is really key uh, to making uh, uh, National Heritage Week work well. Uh, so um, has anybody got any closing thought they would like to add? Any of our panellists like to have something final to say? Um, Lorcan, maybe? Well, uh, I'm just trying to think there now. No, I, I do think it's great that... Um, if you can show children in particular that they are part of the solution rather than, you know, the messages coming out that humans are part of the problem, that's, you know, the solutions are there and they are, the solutions are in their hands. And if we all pull together, that is the solution. That would be great. Yeah. Remember also, if you are involved in projects, your local radio station, your local newspaper, uh, and many of the newspapers and radio stations are online as well, of course, are always really interested in, in interesting stories, things that are being done for the first time, things are connecting with older people or connecting with animals that we might know much about or things like kale that have fallen out of fashion. And that's a, a good way to advertise what you're doing. And even if it doesn't draw 25 more people on the day, it means that another audience has engaged with your project, uh, whatever it is, even if if they haven't been able to go out and do it, they've been able to read about it. And I think people do uh, appreciate when, when, particularly when, when volunteers step in uh, to help during that week, that it's a, a huge benefit to the, to the wider uh, community. Um, uh, looking forward, um, Deirdre Orm here talking about um, reenactment day on August 14th with Knights and Conquests and also celebrating the life of Michael Collins and his Granard collection on August, a connection even, Michael Collins and his Granard connection, indeed. Um, and so looking forward uh, to, to that as well. Um, so uh, Lila, do you have anything you want to add or re-emphasize about the, you know, the dates or the connections or where people can, can get help before we... Yeah, so I, I'll just re-emphasize the resources that are on our website. Um, so again, if you have questions, if you're a new organizer and you have questions about just where to get started, what is a heritage event? What is a digital heritage product project? Um, where can I go to find resources for my interest, whether it's natural built or cultural heritage? That's all on our website under the resources tab. Again, if you are, if you have questions about marketing or advertising, or uh, is the Heritage Council sending out materials, that kind of thing. We have a whole lot of resources as far as logos, 
and templates and PowerPoints and all kinds of things as far as branded items also under the resources section. Um, and finally, if you have questions about anything technical, um, especially for as you work through uploading your, your, uh, your project or your event information, I am on the other side of the phone and the email there, but I encourage you to check out our technical resources page first. Um, it answers your questions about how to upload to YouTube, how to create a Google account so that you can put up slides, um, all kinds of things like that. So check out our website. Um, if your question isn't answered there, you can always give us a call um, here at uh, Heritage Week. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other questions about kind of the logistical side of things, they can um, just let me know now or later on. Yeah. And worth reminding people also that social media is a great way to use, even if you were, for example, to take your camera, just your phone, if, if you have a smartphone, um, take a photograph every day of, of a different plant life or a different flower that is where you live, if you, if you, where, whether you live in the city, in a park or in the country, and just put them over the week. And, and that's a small contribution, but a lovely one because people always love to see photographs of wildlife um, uh, or, or, or wild, wildlife, both, both flowers and uh, both plants and animals, obviously, or by the sea, different types of stones, different types of seaweed. That's a small way of doing it. But if you take have a daily walk with your dog or with your family or your children or by yourself, that's something nice that you might add into the mix during National Heritage Week. And again, easily done if you are if you enjoy social media. That can, that can be increased a very small bit more by adding those species of fauna and flora onto the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Uh -huh. uh, they have an application there that you can put that up and you are now contributing to science. I presume too that there's a hashtag for the week. Yes, and sorry. That, um, Susan, thank you for mentioning that. social media there. Um, yeah. Yes, of course, we are on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram as well as YouTube. Um, the hashtag for this year is just Heritage Week 2022. Nice and simple. Hashtag Heritage Week 2022. I'll be following that hashtag everywhere. Give us a tag as well. So if you do at Heritage Week, then it will come up as a notification right on my phone. I will see it. I will repost. I'll be happy to share. Um, so that's what we're all about is spreading the word here as much as possible in local communities, but also nationally. Um, I also see a question in the chat there. Can we hold an online exhibition? Absolutely. So this would be a digital heritage project. Um, so you'll just select that form when you're in our project organizers portal um, and include all of your website links or anything else that is relevant. Um, if you have a question about, is this a Heritage Week item? The answer is probably yes. But if you're unsure, you can just give us an email just to make sure there. Um, yes, there's another question there about social media hashtags. So again, you can use as many as you like, but the main one that we will be paying attention to is hashtag Heritage Week 2022. And there's a question there also about insurance for events. Now, insurance is always a, a tricky question as anybody that's ever organized an event knows. So yes, it should not be ignored. If you are the event organizer, then people have, if you like, a sense of wanting to know if they're going to take part in something that might have an implication for their, their health and welfare. Uh, they will. They may ask, and they and they are entitled to know the answer. So I don't know if anyone at the Heritage Council is able to respond to that rather chewy yeah. question. Susan, I can take that. Um, hmm. Please, if you like. um, yeah. So it's um, basically um, anyone organising an event, especially if you're a community group or organisation, will generally have their own insurance and should have their own insurance. Um, there's a group called the Public Participation Network. Um, which all local groups can join. Uh, I think as far as I know, it's free to join, um, but they do have um, insurance available there as well. Um, if you're an individual, and you're trying to do something like it, a, a walk in the town or whatever, you should contact um, your local heritage officer um, and see if, if, if they can sort of run the event with you as a participant or organi stroke organizer um, under local authority insurance, but that'll depend, you know, have to have that conversation um, individually at each local authority level. Um, but yeah, insurance is important. Just be aware of the type of event that you're running and um, the safety implications um, that are involved, but there isn't a blanket um, Heritage Week insurance um, if, if that's what people are wondering. 
Is it fair, um, Alwyn, if you were organising an event, let's say yourself or two of you, a walk, as you said, mm -hmm. um, can you say to people as they as they come along, look, we we're not we're not insured, so at your own risk, can you do that? Um, I mean, you can do anything. Obviously, you can do anything. But yeah, it's not what you'd recommend. No, it's know, not but, what you'd recommend. Um, no. It would be better to have that conversation um, with your local heritage officer. It's possible that some of them um, will be able to say, you know, this is a ex county council event but then that that obviously that heritage officer would have to be very very happy um that everything is run everything is in order so that's not something that i suppose we can can guarantee can happen so you would need to certainly be mindful and be aware and have a conversation be it with local heritage officer contact us at heritage week uh .ie, sorry w heritage council at heritage week um and uh we can have a conversation with you around that great okay well um, on that very practical note uh, I, I just wanted to, to answer oh, one other yes, question. Please, Sorry, Susanna, because I, I do realize that this Not is a good all. question from someone in, in the chat box there. Um, just asking for clarification on digital heritage projects. What are those? Um, so this is something that we introduced during COVID um, when we couldn't be doing events in any great capacity. So a digital heritage project can be anything from a video to a podcast, to a PowerPoint, to a website, to a social media campaign. Um, anything that you like that can be shared on the internet. Um, and there are some resources, I put it in the chat there, but in our um, developing a project page, there is an outline of the difference between an in-person event and a digital heritage project. Um, and there are some ideas there as well in the technical resources um, on uh, if, you, if you're a first time video maker, how do you edit a video? How do you take a video on your iPhone? What is SoundCloud? All of these kind of resources will be of use to you, especially if you are someone interested in heritage and don't quite know that you have the resources to create an in-person event, but you still want to participate. Doing so in a digital digital format is a fantastic way to get involved. Terrific. Uh, that's really helpful. Thank you, Lila. And again, our thanks to Michael for his signing, uh, to the panelists for giving their time, Annette and Sarah and Lorcan, and to all of you for coming along and participating, sharing indeed your own uh, thoughts, sharing um, links, and um, we hope and wish you all a very successful uh, National Heritage Week. Remember, taking part is really important. Um, try to keep it straightforward and simple, uh, and most of all, enjoy it all. Um, so our thanks once again to the Heritage Council for organising uh, this great event each year. And I certainly am looking forward very much to it. So thanks again and cheerio. Bye-bye.